So let's look at the integumentary system, which consists of the skin and then associated structures, which are hair, nails, sweat glands, sebaceous glands, and erector pylorum muscle. Okay? So skin consists of two parts, which we'll see, the epidermis and dermis. So this consists of the epidermis and dermis. And these are associated or what are also called the accessory organs of skin. And we'll be describing each one of them in detail. And before we go into each individual part, let's look at a brief preview about the integumentary system. The visible part of your skin, hair, and nails is mostly dead. The surface is the final resting place for cells that once grew below. The skin is the body's largest organ. It says of this. The sweat and oilocrine gland offer two types of protection. Perspiration cool reaches the surface, and the oil glands prevent skin and from dry bacteria. The hard surface of the nail protects the sensitive tips of the face and toes. Hair, air neck. Heat loss and helps keep us warm. The hair, skin, nails, and exocrine glands are all part of a protective network called the integumentary system. So here you got a brief preview about you know it talked about nails which are hard. Um, it talked about hair about how it traps heat. It sort of talked about the glands, sebaceous glands and sweat glands and it also talks about how they prevent bacterial growth so you know they have properties which are known as bactericidal which I'll, I'll do when we look go to that so you know a little bit of introduction so let's look now at the functions it forms your surface of your body so it's obviously protective you know we did when we did tissues we said skin was stratified squamous keratinized epithelium remember the keratin is quite thick so that forms a surface barrier so that's how it helps to protect you so apart from being a covering it's thick so it's protective because of the keratin layer it has these antibacterial properties and these are because of the sweat that is produced and we have another gland called the sebaceous gland, which we'll see, which it talks of. These sebaceous glands are also known as oil glands. So sweat is acidic in pH. Anything which is acidic prevents bacteria from growing. So it prevents bacteria from colonizing or making colonies and growing. And sebaceous glands also secrete certain what are called lysozymes, which are again antibacterial. So they prevent bacterial growth. Another way sweat does it, if you know, if you sweat profusely, it kind of washes off the bacteria. So you can see it helps to do that too. It kind of helps to wash off the bacteria. So that's another way that it can be antibacterial. Skin maintains body temperature, so very important in homeostasis. And if you think of it, when we are cold, when we feel really cold, uh, what do you notice? People look very pale because the blood vessels constrict. So during cold, your blood vessels will constrict. If your blood vessels constrict, that means less blood is flowing through that area. So heat is not lost through the blood. Your hair, you know, when you feel really cold, have you ever noticed your hair standing up? It, that hair, when it stands up, it tends to trap heat between the hair follicles. 
it's not so important in us, but in animals, if you see, because they have thick fur, and when the hair stands up, it helps to trap more heat. In us too, a little bit. So then again, that helps. So you prevent heat loss. Also, if you've noticed, whenever you feel cold, you tend to kind of constrict your body posture and you try to make it as small as possible. You know, when you're sleeping, you kind of tend to be curled up. So again, less surface exposed to the environment and again, you don't lose heat. Look at the opposite thing. When you're hot, what happens? Your skin looks very flushed because now the blood vessels dilate. So when they dilate, more blood is flowing through the area, heat can be lost from the surface. You sweat. When the sweat dries off or evaporates, your body temperature comes down. Your hair is, doesn't stand erect, so you don't trap heat. And also, again, if you think of body posture, when you're hot, you kind of lie down in a manner where you're spread out. Again, more surface area exposed to the environment so you can cool off. Okay, so you can see how it maintains body temperature. It prevents water loss, helps to conserve it because not only is the outer surface of outer surface layer, the keratin is waterproof. And we'll see later, it's because of production of certain oils which actually coat the cells and that makes them waterproof. So that's how we prevent water loss and conserve water. And if you think about it, if, if someone is dehydrated, even on a hot day, they won't sweat. Because when, when you sweat, you lose water, right? So if you're already dehydrated, you don't sweat. So you, at the skin, automatically, the, the thermostat in the hypothalamus is, is, and along with other areas of the body, they function in such a manner that they want to conserve water at that time when you're dehydrated, okay? On the other hand, when your water levels are fine and it's a hot day, you sweat profusely. It's because you want to get, you know, you want to cool down and bring your body temperature back to normal. Excretion and absorption. Excretion is waste are excreted by means of through sweat because sweat contains uh, not only water but it contains other substances too. And certain oily substances can be absorbed through the surface of skin. That's why you put lotions which have an oil base. So they can be absorbed through the surface of the skin. There are certain metabolic functions the skin has. Vitamin D is present under the skin in an inactive form and under the influence of ultraviolet light, this vitamin D gets activated. So UV light activates vitamin D, which is why they tell you that you should go out in the sun. You, everybody needs a certain amount of sun exposure every day. Of course, too much of it is, too ba is bad for you. So, you know, that's why you have to apply your sunscreen. People who live in areas where they do not see sunlight actually suffer from a disease which is known as rickets, where the bones are not ossified properly or they don't have enough calcium. How does this relate with vitamin D? Vitamin D is very important because it allows the body to absorb calcium. It allows the body to absorb calcium from the gastrointestinal tract. When you drink milk and you, it goes into your gastrointestinal tract and your gastrointestinal tract absorbs it, it requires the presence of vitamin D to actually be able to absorb that calcium. Calcium is also absorbed from the kidney tubules, where again vitamin D is very important. So that's why if you, you know, next time you go to the store, look at, you know, you take capsules of calcium. Usually they have vitamin D3, which is the activated form. So if you don't have exposure to sunlight, you'll have less vitamin D, which means calcium absorption will be less. Calcium is very important for bones. So it's not going to be deposited properly in the bones and you end up with rickets. Okay, so their bones are cartilaginous. They tend to kind of uh, uh, these children, you'll find they don't grow very tall. The bones are stunted. They kind of can get bow-legged because of the, you know, weight of the body on uh, on the various bones. Yes? Um, if you put sunscreen on, would that still absorb the sunlight? Would you still get vitamin D? Yes, you would, you would still get vitamin D. When you put sunscreen, you're just protecting uh, the the nuclei, you know, the ultraviolet light from damaging the okay. the nuclei of the cells. 
then the skin also is a storehouse for glycogen, which is a complex polysaccharide, and cholesterol. So these are some of the metabolic functions of skin. Then the skin, the uh, epidermis of the skin, the lowest layer or the deepest layer of the epidermis has special cells known as melanocytes which produce melanin. And what melanin does is it acts like an umbrella over the cell. So if this is the cell and this is the nucleus, it acts like an umbrella over the cell nucleus. So these are the melanin granules. So it helps protect the nucleus from the harmful effects of ultraviolet light. If we didn't have melanin granules in us, this, these, um, uh, the nuclei, the DNA inside the nuclei could mutate. There could be changes and that could cause cancers. So that's why you have this melanin. Now, all of us have the same, approximately the same number of melanocytes. It is only the amount of melanin that these melanocytes produce that is different. So someone who is extremely fair-skinned will produce, their melanocytes will produce less melanin. Those who are a little darker, their melanocytes produce more melanin. What did I say? The ones who are lighter, their melanocytes produce less melanin. Those who are darker, their melanocytes produce more melanin. In fact, when you go out in the sun and you tan, uh, or even you know in the tanning booth, what it does is it, the, the light stimulates the melanocytes to produce more melanin. Each melanocyte now produces more melanin, which then goes into the lower layers and it sort of coats the cells, you know, it forms an umbrella over there, and that gives rise to the darker color. After some time, when those cells kind of reach the top, they die off, so your tan fades away after some time. Okay, you had a question? Does the, the amount of melanin that the melanocytes produce, does that change over time? Because I know when I was younger, I tanned really well. Now, I just burn. So is that something that is affected by age? Could be. I'm not really sure about that, but it could be. It could be affected by age. It could be. could be. And then in the skin, you have a lot of receptors in the epidermis as well as the dermis, which allow you to be able to uh, respond to all kinds of cutaneous sensation. I mean, you know, if you touch something hot, you can feel it. You touch cold. So these are thermal receptors. Uh, you, you know, if somebody... Uh, pokes you or, you know, sort of just puts a little pressure, you can feel that. You can feel the difference between light touch and deep pressure, right? So these are mechanoreceptors. You feel pain. If you poke yourself in a, by a thorn, you feel pain. So these are free, what are called free nerve endings. So you have all these receptors. You have receptors which allow you to feel touch and pressure. They go together. Uh, pain. Uh, temperature. So all of this is felt by skin. So again, you can see teeming with these receptors which allow different cutaneous sensations. Now let's look at the structure of skin. So when we talk of skin, it actually consists of just two layers. Epidermis, which is the epithelial layer, and dermis, which is below that, which consists of connective tissue and it has the nerves and glands and everything in it. We often, whenever we talk of skin, we often include another layer called the hypodermis, which is also called the subcutaneous layer. And when you did adipose tissue, you, you uh, one of the places where adipose tissue was found was subcutaneous layer. So subcutaneous layer consists of fat. So this is the fat which is present below the dermis. So you can see this layer which is all fat here. This is the hypodermis. This part here is the epidermis. It's the epithelium. And remember the epithelium in skin is stratified, squamous, keratinized type of epithelium. And then this large layer is the dermis, where you can see here, you can see these sweat glands. So if you look, you can see these sweat glands, 
You can see a muscle here called the erector pili or erector pylorum muscle. We'll do each of, each one of these uh, separately. You see these other glands called sebaceous glands, which are the oil glands. You see hair follicles and a hair root. You can see this plexus of blood vessels. Blood vessels are always drawn in red and blue, red for artery, blue for vein. And you also see these nerve plexuses. So you can see these sensory nerve fibers, nervous structures. So you can see how the dermis consists of connective tissue with a lot of blood vessels, nerves, glands, and receptors. The hypodermis is adipose tissue. And the epidermis is the epithelium. Okay? Let's look at the epithelium now. So this was stratified squamous keratinized epithelium. So it was stratified, which means it has many layers. So everything that you did in unit one, now you're going to be using. So it is many layered. So you can see how many layers there are. So if you go from below upwards, this would be the deepest layer. That means this layer is the one which is closest to the dermis. This layer here is the one which is closest to the dermis, this one. So it's the deepest layer. And then this up on top is the most superficial layer. So let's start with the deepest layer here. It is single layered. It's deep. It kind of forms the base. So it is known as stratum basal. Stratum, the word stratum comes from strata, which means layers. So the word stratum comes from strata or layers. That's why everything has the word stratum in front of it. Basal layer, that means everything else sits on top of it. So that's why it's stratum basal. It also has another name known as stratum germinativum. Stratum germinativum. What does the word germinate mean? To procreate, right? Like, you know, you put a seed and it germinates like it's coming alive. So germinativum means that this is the layer which actually gives rise to the other cells. So this layer is the one where a lot of mitosis occurs. So this is the layer which actually cell division occurs here and then all the other cells are produced. So when you cut yourself and you know a part of the stratum basal goes, you'll see when we do wound healing, it is actually because of the stratum basal cells which now try to come close to each other that the wound closes. Okay, the epidermis. In the stratum basal, and here you can see this is a mitotic figure that you're looking at. Look here, this is a mitotic figure. So this should tell you that, you know, mitosis occurs in this layer. In the stratum basal, you will see melanocytes, the ones we just talked about. So melanocytes are present here in the stratum basal. So some of the features, mitosis occurs here. Melanocytes are present. And if you notice, I have highlighted this cell called the Merkel cell. Merkel cell. So you see this cell? It is also present in the stratum basal. This Merkel cell, it is most of your receptors for cutaneous sensation are present in the dermis. But this is one cell which is present in the epidermis. So it's an epidermal receptor for touch and pressure. So I use the word touch and pressure interchangeably. So if it's given as touch in your notes, I mean pressure. If you get a question on, you know, which is a pressure receptor or a touch receptor, it's both the same. And which is an epidermal touch or pressure receptor? It's this Merkel cell, okay? In the epidermis, yes. Only cell in the epidermis, which is a touch and pressure receptor. You have others in the dermis. The next layer, which is many layered, so this stratum basal is single layered, usually cuboidal to columnar cells. The next layer, which is many layered, is known as stratum spinosum. 
So this whole layer is called stratum spinosum. The cells look very spiny. So can you see these cells are looking, you have these little sort of spines coming out. These are actually desmosomes. If you remember when we did the cell, we talked about desmosomes, which kind of kept cells together and helped to um, spread the stress out. So these, the stratum spinosum, the cells look prickly. It's also known as the prickle cell layer. Prickle cell layer because the cells look prickly. So these cells have desmosomes in them, which kind of actually attach them. The reason you see them like this is because when we process the tissue, the cells shrink a little bit, and that's why these little prickly desmosomes are seen. It is made up of cells which are known as keratinocytes. Actually, most of the cells are keratinocytes except for the few named ones. So even in the stratum uh, bazel, you have keratinocytes. Those which are not keratinocytes would be either Merkel cells or melanocytes. Now here, all of these cells are keratinocytes. And in the stratum spinosum, you see this important cell called Langerhans cell. This Langerhans cell is also known, you might see it in books, it's also called a dendritic cell. So in the stratum spinosum, you have this Langerhans cell. Whenever I talk about a cell, you must always know its function. The function of Langerhans cell is in the immune response. It takes part in the immune response. It's phagocytic. The function of the melanocyte, remember, was to produce melanin. The Merkel cell was a touch pressure receptor. So this Langerhans cell is a phagocytic cell, takes part in the immune response. Now in these cells of the stratum spinosum, little pre-keratin filaments are present because, you know, remember the epithelium is stratified squamous keratinized. We have need to produce keratin. It's going to be produced from below and then finally reach the top. So you have little pre-keratin filaments. Then we come to the next layer, which is called stratum granulosum. It's called granulosum because under the microscope, you can actually see granules in them. And these granules which are seen in the stratum granulosum are two types of granules. You have these lamellar granules and you have others which are called keratohyaline granules. So keratohyaline plus lamellar granules. Keratohyaline and lamellar. Keratohyaline granules come from these pre-keratin filaments. They become keratohyaline granules, then they give rise to keratin filaments which will travel all the way up to the top and be seen on the top. The lamellar granules are, are granules which actually secrete an oily substance. The lamellar granules secrete something called a gly oily glycolipid. And what it does is it actually goes and coats these cells from the outside. So it's like it makes the cells really tough. And by coating it with an oily sort of fluid on the outside, it prevents water loss. That's how the skin is able to conserve water and prevent water loss. The keratin, of course, is protective and it acts like a barrier. The next layer is a usually a glassy Clear, you know, it looks kind of glassy or clear. The word lucid means clear. So this is a glassy looking layer which consists of dead cells. Now the cells are big, starting to die, so the nuclei begin to disappear. So if you notice still here, you see the nuclei. You can see nuclei. Here you don't see any nuclei, so cells are kind of dying now. So stratum lucidum, but this is only seen in thick skin. So in the thick skin of your palms and soles. Thick skin is seen in palms and soles. So that's where you see stratum lucidum. Thin skin, for example. Thin skin is like your skin of your face. Or wherever you have hair, that is usually thin skin. 
So thin skin, you do not have stratum lucidum. So thin skin is often known as hairy skin. Thick skin is often known as non-hairy skin. Okay. The last layer is stratum corneum, where now the cells are totally dead. They tend to kind of flake off. This is where keratin is present. But they are thick, so it, uh, it helps to protect. It's an efficient barrier, prevents water loss. So it does all of that. So keratinization starts from the bottom. It goes all the way up. It takes a while for these cells to get keratinized and reach the top. But sometimes in certain diseases like psoriasis, what happens is that cells, the keratinization occurs really fast. So the cells kind of regenerate really, really fast. So the cells begin to flake off and you get little sort of um, plaque-like um, reddish areas on the surface. And I've got a picture to show you what psoriasis looks like. Uh, it's thought to be an autoimmune disease because um, they think that something in the body is kind of triggering off these cells and making them multiply so fast that they reach the, the top much faster than they should. Okay, uh, Causes a lot of itching and a lot of other problems. It might even actually end up causing psoriatic arthritis. Okay, let's look at the first question. What do you think is the primary function of melanocytes? You can change, you can, yeah. yeah. Okay, I need some more. Okay, very good. Yes, the main function of the melanocytes is to protect the nucleus. Giving skin its color is just a secondary feature. The main function is to protect the nucleus from the damaging effects of the ultraviolet light. light. Very good. Now, while we're talking about melanin, just as a side fact, actually, melanin is of many types. There's something known as eumelanin, and that's why people have different colors. Uh, you know, some people are very pink, some people have a very, you know, they're extremely pale in color. Uh, so there's one pigment known as eumelanin, there's another one known as pheomelanin. Pheomelanin has more of the reddish sort of tinge of uh, you is a little bit more brown. Feo is more reddish. Okay, here's another question. Why do you think the superficial layer of cells are dead? Very good, yes. They are far away from their source of nutrition. Melanocytes have nothing to do with the nutrition of a cell. A cell will die if it doesn't get nutrition, right? 
And if you think, remember, epithelium was avascular. It depended on getting its nutrition from the lower layers of connective tissue. Now, dermis was a connective tissue layer, and you saw the blood vessels there. So the further away you they were from the uh, dermis, the less likely they are to get their blood supply and nutrition, so that's why they die, okay? Which is why in stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium, you will find that even the top layer, the cells have become very thin, but they still have their nucleus because they, the number of layers is not that much. The top layer is thin enough to get its blood, uh, to get nutrition from, you know, from the lower uh, connective tissue layer. Okay. okay, what do you think is the stratum corneum's function? So this was a bit mixed. Okay. Uh, the correct answer is B and C. See, here's where you've got to think. The function is not to flake off. It just so happens that because it's dead, it tends to flake off. What good would it do to have a function to flake off? Nothing? Just litter your bed with a lot of dead cells? Right? So its function is not to flake off. So that's where you've got to kind of think a little critically when you get questions like this. It just so happens that because it's dead, it tends to flake off. Its function is to protect the sea. What are the prote what what are some of the functions? Protection, um, you know, like waterproofing the skin, providing nutrition, uh, immune response, producing melanin. These are kind of functions, right? So here, protecting the skin and waterproofing the skin, that those are the functions of this. It just so happens because it's dead that it tends to flake off. That's not a function. That's just sort of a side effect, let's say. Okay? So therefore, B and C is the correct answer. So wouldn't you, I mean, flaking off, didn't you use that as an example of protection because of um, bacteria and things like that? That was the sweat. I was oh, talking the about the sweat, sweat. Okay. yeah. But not the skin. No, no. Now here are the cell types in the epidermis. There are four types of cells that you'll see. Keratinocytes. Most of the cells which you saw on those layers, they were keratinocytes. So they about, you can see, you know, go up to about 90%. The next large number of cells we have are melanocytes. And then we have Langerhans cells, which are also, as I said, called dendritic cells and Merkel cells. So whenever you get something like the cell types in your notes on your PowerPoint, automatically write down the function. Keratinocytes to produce keratin. Melanocytes produce melanin and protect the nucleus. Langerhans cells, these were phagocytic, took part in the immune response. Merkel cells, they were the touch and pressure receptors. So cutaneous sensation. So that's the function of these cell types. And if you look at it, a keratinocyte very prickly. Melanocyte with these melanin granules, which they are produced in the basal layer, but they go up to the, you know, the bottom few layers of the stratum spinosum, and that's where the color is seen. Langerhans cells, phagocytic and immune response, and here's a Merkel cell. Tactile means touch or pressure, and here's the nerve which kind of will take the impulse from it. So this is a receptor. I already mentioned tanning. I told you that when somebody tans, the number of melanocytes doesn't increase, but under the effect of ultraviolet li light, the amount of melanin produced increases. And the idea is to protect the nucleus. So more melanin is produced, and that happens to give the skin a darker color. So here are two conditions. 
this is psoriasis. So you can see these, these areas, these are known as plaques. So this is very thick skin at that area. Up here, very red and sore, it's very itchy. And vitiligo is a condition which is again thought to be autoimmune where the immune system is kind of attacking itself, attack, attacking the body and it attacks the melanocytes. So there are areas of deep pigmentation. So in vitiligo there are areas of deep pigmentation. Usually seen in the gums, extensor surfaces like the elbows, hands, like this is an example over here. It's not contagious, tends to sometimes run in families, but it's not that you can kind of spread it or anything like that. And it, it tends to kind of progress very slowly. Yes. It's okay. What the line is, is it like reversible? Does like, do you ever regain that pigmentation? Um, not usually because it's autoimmune, so the melanocytes are kind of turned off. Okay. Certain uh, treat, I mean, uh, people try different treat treatments where some amount kind of, uh, you know, may come back, but I don't know whether you can totally cure it. Okay. Yeah. Does it grow? Uh, it does progress, but slowly. It does progress, but slowly, yes. Um, some doctors will recommend or prescribe blue or... Yeah, they like I said. They're no that what you they uh, that they prescribe for dandruff. There's a bacteria that get that it, it creates a cell that gets infected by the Okay, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, what you're talking about is a fungal infection called tenia. Tenia versicolor, that's the infection and usually seen in moist, uh, greasy areas. So, you know, when people have very, very long hair, um, especially boys with very long hair, which they don't wash often. So the neck, uh, you know, the back of the neck and here it's kind of uh, full of this. Then you kind of lift up that and you'll see these deep pigmented spots in that area, uh, you know, kind of. But it's not in one big thing like this, they're little, little spots. And that is because of a fungal infection. And yes, then they do give uh, some of these cells in blue and things. So that is a fungal infection. It's known as tenia. Okay. And that disappears. It goes up. You know how some people get sunspots? Is that just some, what is that? You know how like some people like lay out and they'll get like brown marks on their face? That, that in those areas, again, it is like something like freckles, where freckles are because of an increase in melanin just at that spot. Okay. So these are pretty similar to that. That's hyperpigmentation. Pardon? That's hyperpigmentation. That's, That's hyperpigmentation. Out. Yeah. But you're just talking about sunspots. Like when I tan, when I used to tan, my back is mm -hmm. like white, but the brown parts are like spotted, similar to that. So sunspots, like what is that from? No, that what you're talking about is not sunspots. Sunspots are usually seen in much older people sometimes. In the, yeah. Uh, those are areas of, you know, where the pigmentation doesn't occur normally in those areas. So that's what those are. And freckles are where the, uh, where the melanin pigment is deeply concentrated. Okay, and that gives rise to, and usually people with a particular, very pale skin tend to get a lot more pigmentation as, you know, get a lot of freckles. That the melanin is more concentration of melanin over there. So let's look at the overview of the epidermis. The epithelium is stratified squamous, keratinized. So remember that, keratinized. No blood vessels. Four types of cells. There are four distinct layers. Fifth layer is included only in thick skin. So thick skin has these four layers plus an additional layer. Thin skin only has those four layers. And here is a histological picture of skin. So here you can see all of this is the dermis, this part here. This is the stratum basal. We can't see the melanocytes, but usually in a, in a well-stained um, well slide, the melanocytes will show up as brown to blackish, so let's say, you'll see as dark granules. So you can actually see these melanin granules like this in 
in these cells, you can't make out an individual melanocyte. Then here you can see the stratum spinosum. The granulosum, you can definitely make out the granules. This layer is a stratum lucidum, usually seen as thin, blue, glassy looking layer. Here it's a little pinkish. And here is stratum corneum where you can see the cell outlines but no nuclei because the cells are dead. Let's look at the dermis now. This is the connective tissue layer. So here is where you find connective tissue. So you'll find loose connective tissue and you'll find dense irregular connective tissue. You'll also see hair follicles. You'll see glands, the sweat and sebaceous glands, nerves, blood vessels. Also in the dermis, you will see this smooth muscle, which I haven't mentioned here, but you'll see this smooth muscle called erector pylorum. There are two main regions of the dermis. The top layer is called the papillary layer, and you'll see why, because it kind of throws little projections. Papilla, the word papilla means a projection. Whenever you see anything which looks somewhat like a mountain, you call it a papilla. A protrusion, that's a papilla. So this papillary layer is the superficial of the layers of the dermis. It contains loose areolar connective tissue. And then the rest of the dermis, most of it, is called the reticular layer. So here you see dense irregular connective tissue. Remember the function of dense irregular connective tissue can withstand stress from different directions. And what does connective tissue contain, especially dense connective tissue? A lot of collagen bundles, right? So these collagen bundles, they run in different directions and there are areas where these bundles have little separations. So in your skin, because of the way these collagen bundles run and that areas of separation, they form little lines which are known as cleavage lines. So these are because of the way the collagen bundles are arranged in the dermis. So if you notice, you will see that in your limbs, they kind of tend to be arranged in a longitudinal fashion, more or less longitudinal, you know, running kind of this way, except at the joints where you can see they're running horizontally. So again, look at the upper limb, they're running in a more or less longitudinal fashion. In the trunk area, they circle the trunk, so they're running transversely. So can you see this? And again, in the face also, they run longitudinally. In certain areas, like the cheek area, you can see they are kind of running in this fashion. The reason we want to know how these cleavage lines run becomes particularly important in plastic surgery. Because if you make an incision which goes against the cleavage line, the wound will tend to gape. So if I was to kind of do make an incision in the thoracic region, because the cleavage li lines run in this fashion, if I make an incision like this, parallel to the way the collagen bundles run, the gaping of the wound will not be much. If I make an incision in this manner, can you understand the wound will gape? Okay, so plastic surgeons make use of this very often. They always want to make nice, clean incisions where after the surgery you can barely make out that. So, it can, it, you know, these cleavage lines pay a lot of uh, importance in plastic surgery, but otherwise too, you know, general surgeons too, you'll find wherever possible they like to go parallel to the cleavage line so that the scar that is formed it's, is thin and, you know, the wound doesn't gape too much and you don't have a thick, unsightly scar at that point. How come with the C-section they, they go across? No. What, what's that? When they do, yeah, they do, that has different reasons because in the C-section when they do that, that is because of the approach they want to go below the peritoneum. So you do have a scar. Um, they want, that's because, you, you can't always kind of keep to this. You've got to see which is the better of the two options. They don't want to, they want to prevent going through the peritoneal cavity. So that's why they go through a lower abdominal wound. Okay. 
So here now let's look at the dermis. Let's look at this image here. So first let's see, you can see this top layer, which is about 20% of the dermis. This is called the papillary layer. It's called papillary because can you see these little projections which are poking out? These are known as dermal papillae. And then below that, this thicker part of the dermis, this is the reticular layer. And this has, you know, you can see it has hair follicles, it has sebaceous glands, it has this erector pylorum muscle, sweat glands, it has all these nerve endings or nervous structures, so you can see that. And below the reticular layer is this hypodermis. This is the subcutaneous tissue. It's not truly a part of skin, but we often, you know, always kind of when we describe skin, we put this in. It's called hypodermis. The word hypo means below. So that's why below dermis. So that's what it is. So let's look at this papillary layer, loose areolar tissue. And what this papillary layer, you want the epidermis and the dermis to kind of interlock really well with each other. You don't want one to be separated from the other. So if you notice, what happens is that this papillary layer of the dermis is thrown up into little projections which are known as dermal papillae. And these dermal papillae, especially if you look at your fingers and toes, and look at, you can all look at your fingers, and you will see that if you look, you know, you have those whorls on your fingers, all of us have, diff it's very different, you know, some people have them looking like this, others have, you know, different ways that these are. So you can see it's kind of little ridged. So what happens in thick skin is that these dermal papillae, they, this projection, they raise this part of the, of the dermis too to go over it. So they kind of raise a ridge, the papilla raises a ridge of dermal tissue over it, which is known as a dermal ridge. <laughs> and because of the presence of this dermal ridge, the epidermis also gets lifted on top. So you have what is known as an epidermal ridge. So let me explain and try and draw this for you. So imagine you have a papilla like this, a raised projection. Because this is raised the part of the dermis which is raised on top, it forms a ridge. So this is the papilla. This ridge which is raised because of the papilla is known as the dermal ridge. Since the epidermis lies on top of it, the epidermis will also be raised on top, right? It will be pushed up. And that part will be known as the epidermal ridge. Can you understand that? Okay. These three things together are known as friction ridges. And these are what give our, you, our everybody, every individual, their characteristic fingerprints. These friction ridges, because the, the sweat glands open in between, they, that's why they kind of, you know, they are a little moist and you can leave your fingerprints all over the place. Uh, the way the friction ridges are made is genetically determined. So uh, one individual's friction ridges will, or fingerprints will be different from another individual's fingerprints, okay? So these friction ridges are what are responsible for your characteristic fingerprints. Hands and feet, you see these, you see these ridges are on, on the surface of your thin skin also, but they are not that, since thin skin is so thin, you don't find these epidermal and dermal ridges being so well defined. They are bet, much better defined in your, where, where you have thick skin, okay? And that's where you usually take your fingerprints from. If they are identical twins, because they come from the same genetic material, their fingerprints will be the same. But not uh, fraternal twins will be different. Yeah, only except for identical twins, everybody else's uh, fingerprints would differ. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Identical because they come from the same, uh, yeah. Yeah. Second layer is the reticular layer, which as I said, consists of dense irregular connective tissue. And in this, you can see the appendages of skin. 
the appendages mean also if you remember were known as accessory organs of skin so that's why i highlight these areas and you should look at these highlights so that you know this is how visually you'll remember so what are the accessory organs of skin sweat glands sebaceous glands erector pylorum hair follicles with the hair notice these blood vessels which are present so these blood vessels are the ones which will feed all of the connective tissue and through diffusion it will also feed the epidermis you can see this big hair this is the hair and it is surrounded we'll see later by the epidermis going down like this and kind of enveloping it which is known as a hair follicle we have sebaceous glands you can see these sebaceous glands lying so that's why pay attention to this picture look at these sebaceous glands here also are sebaceous glands these sebaceous glands are connected to the hair follicle so therefore that's how you'll remember what would be the function when i talk about the function of the hair follicle you you can understand it will have to, something to do with the hair right because it's attached to the hair follicle so you do not find um hair on thick skin right thick skin is also called hairless skin do you think you'll find sebaceous glands in thick skin no so because they are attached to hair follicles if you don't have hair you won't have sebaceous glands over there okay here you can see sweat glands I and mean, there are different types of two types of sweat glands so you can see here one which is known as an eccrine sweat gland uh which is seen in most of your body or uh, later when we do sweat glands i'll show you there's another kind called apocrine sweat gland which is usually connected to a hair follicle and um that gives a little more thick milky kind of a, a sweat whereas eccrine sweat glands usually produce a very thin kind of sweat uh then let's look at some nervous structure so here are some nerve endings there are different kind of nerve endings which you find some are what are known as free nerve endings which are usually to do with pain so free nerve endings are pain receptors you have these lamellar corpuscles which are these ones these are pressure or touch receptors you have others which can actually sense vibration if you took a tuning fork and put it on your hand you can kind of feel that vibration so you have other receptors which kind of can take care of uh, can sort of sense that so here is a histological picture of the dermis so here you can see these dark granules or melanin granules which are present in the stratum basal a few melanin the melanin granules do go to the lower most layers of stratum spinosum and then after that they kind of die off you don't see them here is the papillary layer and then here this is the reticular layer where you can see this dense irregular connective tissue and this is a cut section of probably a hair follicle it's too small to be able to tell and here you can see this is the keratin on top so because i said hair follicle this and you can also see that the layer of keratin is very thin so this is thin skin now we often sustain a lot of wounds so, you know you kind of scratch yourself somewhere sometimes you you know take off a good bit of your skin but the healing occurs quite quickly so there are three phases that a wound goes through of course larger wounds will tend to take longer to heal deeper wounds will also take longer to heal and depending on where the areas and other things you might have you know delay in wound healing but let's look at the phases the first is what is called an inflammatory phase where this is the first phase where the wound has just occurred so usually the blood vessels are broken so they bleed so there is you know the blood clot kind of fills that area so it kind of helps to seal that wound platelets come the blood clots so the wound is sealed at that time and at this point because there has been an injury certain chemicals are liberated and they cause these macrophages to come to that site and they kind of try to remove any cell debris so there's a bit of swelling going on that's why it's known as the inflammatory phase uh, you know the description is given in your notes 
After this, the wound now wants to heal. So, what you have is known as a proliferative or also called an organization stage. So, the fibroblasts in the surrounding dermis, because the dermis contains collagen fibers and it will have fibroblasts. So, the fibroblasts begin to multiply and they lay down collagen fibers so that they bridge the gap across. The coagulated blood now forms a scab. You've all seen after a few days, you know, your blood on the top, it kind of becomes a bit of a scab. If you actually remove the scab, bleeding occurs because here at that point, the blood vessels which were broken, now the blood vessels also start making tiny buds which kind of will try to meet and make sure that the blood vessel also sort of regenerates. So when you remove a scab at that point, because those blood vessels are still growing, you actually break them. And so that's why you bleed again. So that's why picking at a scab is not good. And then if you notice here, the epithelium was cut. Here, notice regeneration has started. So the basal layer, they, that actually tends to grow across. So the, especially the stratum basal. Remember I said it was called stratum germinativum because it's capable of reproducing or multiplying. The cells can divide and, you know, make more cells. And even the lower layers of stratum spinosum are capable of do, doing that. And usually they say mitosis occurs more at night. But stratum basal is the most important layer. So here you can see how it's going across and has bridged the gap. And slowly this blood clot will be thrown off and the, all of this area will also heal. So you can see up here too, it's healed and complete healing takes place. Sometimes you may not even see a scar. However, if the wound is really large or very, very deep, then what happens is, let's say the wound is really large. Imagine if the wound is from here to here. This, these cells may not be able to bridge the gap. They may not kind of be able to do that. So what will happen is all this collagen fiber which is present over here, that is actually going to kind of come to this area. So you'll have more scar tissue. You may have seen people, in, so if they have really big wounds, the skin looks at that point where, you know, the wound is present. You can see that area looks a little different from the rest of the skin and because that's been replaced by this collagen fiber which forms scar tissue. Okay. So let's look at wound healing. The primary objective of the healing process is to fill the gap created by tissue destruction and restore the structural continuity of the injury. Wound healing is commonly divided into three beginning with the inflammatory. Inflammation aims primarily moving the injury causing agent and limiting the extent of tissue damage as it prepares the wound environment for healing. Inflammation like redness, swelling, heat, pain, and loss of function. The phase B arterioles and venue the site of injury constrictly. They dilate, promote ingestion, and accompanying inquiry permeability leads to the movement of fluid into the affected tissue. Increasing viscosity causes the blood to Sites and emigrate through the vessel walls into the inflamed tissue, where the leukocytes engulf and degrade called phagocytosis. Phagocytosis is part of the immune mechanism to prevent an infection that would Subsequently, the release of growth factors leads to the attraction of fibrosis. Fibrosis marks the Beginning of the second phase of wound healing, the proliferative phase. During the proliferative phase, the focus moves to the building of new tissue to fill the space. Fibroblasts are connective tissue cells that send secret collagen. So secret growth factors that induce the growth of blood vessels through a process called angiogenesis while promoting endothelial cell prolifer migration. Fibroblasts and endothelial cell granulation that serve the foundation of scar tissue development. Granulation tissue contains newly developed capillary buds. The tissue is pink and because 
and allow plasma protein and white blood cells to leak into the tissues. The final stage is epithelialization, which is the regeneration, migration, proliferation, and differentiation of epithelials at the deform surface to that destroyed by the injury. End of the progressive stage. White blood cells leave the wound site. Edema begins to as and the wound healing is the remodeling phase. Ends after about three and can this stage final scar tissue is being formed by simultaneous and lysis of collagen. The scar becomes scar tissue may add to 80% of tensile strength by the end of three months. Wound healing is affiliated by action, followed by restoration of the structural part. Three for healing. The inflammatory phase. The proliferative phase and the remodeling phase. Look at which of the following situations would wound heal. So think critically on this and then answer. Okay, very good. Yes, all of the above. Yes, age. The older you get, the longer it takes for wound healing because everything deteriorates with age. You know, blood supply becomes poorer, regenerative capacity becomes less, skin is a little thicker, collagen fibers are not laid down as free, uh, you know, the fibroblasts don't work as well. Uh, picking at a scab, obviously if you keep picking at a scab, you're going to destroy the granulation tissue, the new blood vessels, you're going to keep tearing at them. So again, that doesn't help. Location. Wounds which are present over joints tend to heal worse than air wounds which are not present over joints. Because think of it, if a wound is present at the point of your elbow, you're constant, first of all, it's a bony area. So then, you know, you constantly move that area and the wound tends to kind of break off often. Uh, compare that to a wound just on the surface of the of your forearm or something, you know, which you're not going to move, that joint. So wounds over joints tend to take longer to heal. Blood supply becomes important. If anywhere, wherever the blood supply is poor, tendons tend to have a poor blood supply. Uh, ligaments tend, they are dense, regular connective tissue. They tend to have a poor blood supply. So when you have something called a sprain, I, uh, many of you may have at some point, uh, you know, sprained your ankle or sprained any your wrist or anything where the tendon or the ligaments are torn. They take much longer to heal than bone, than an actual fracture because bone is very richly supplied with blood. So heals much faster. You saw how blood is very necessary because it brings macrophages, it brings all those other growth factors and that helps. So blood supply becomes very important. In fact, diabetics who tend to have poor blood supply and also because their uh, blood is very rich in, um, in glucose, that kind of attracts fungal infection. So diabetics tend to have, you know, you've heard of them having poor wound healing. One of the reasons is because the, uh, the high blood sugar levels causes changes in blood vessels, so the blood vessels get are not able to perform their function. And the second is because of this high blood sugar levels, 
fungal infections and bacteria tend to thrive. Just like us, they like sugar too. So they tend to thrive in that. And wherever there is an infection, obviously you have another process going on. So normal wound healing cannot occur. Okay? So you can see all of these would affect um, wound healing. Okay, regeneration of the epithelium when a wound is sustained is brought about primarily by which layer? Regeneration, remember I told you stratum basale, also called stratum germinativum. So that is the layer which brings about, see that's the bottom layer. That's the one which is going to cause help to divide, the cells divide and they kind of help to seal the gap. Stratum corneum is dead. Stratum granulosum is too far up. And stratum spinosum is you know, the next layer. Stratum basale is the primary layer, okay? It's D, the answer is D, yes. Okay, I'm going to stop here and uh, we'll continue with this.